Okay, uh, welcome back. I uh, had a lovely uh, meditation this morning. Um, we're going to go on now. Yesterday we really completed uh, all the uh, six parts of the main meditation that we've been doing this weekend. And I just wanted to introduce you to a couple of alternatives. Unfortunately, of course, being such a short weekend, even um, just that one meditation, I feel like we haven't had enough time. But I'm so keen because there's so many lovely meditations. I'd really love to introduce you to lots. Um, but I thought I'd just do a couple more this morning and, and uh, see. But before we do, were there any questions that came up you know, overnight or during the meditation? Clear up before we move on. All right, so I thought I'd just, um, you know, there's so many meditations. There's another meditation called Tonglen, which is giving and receiving, which is a compassion-based meditation where you actually imagine light going out and giving them what they need and then taking on their suffering. So um, that's another great meditation which we won't go into. Um, one alternative I thought, again, I would just introduce you to just so you're aware of it and you can go and research it if you want, is if you're in Buddhist circles, it won't be long before you hear about the four Brahma Viharas. Has anyone heard of the Brahma Viharas? Yeah. So, Brahma is of course the god of the Hindu tradition and Vihara is his realm. So it's like the realms of Brahma or divine realms that uh, you can dwell in and uh, these are really uh, considered um, you know beautiful as I say completely different realms if you meditate on these aspects and go so deeply into them that they start to become your world and they are what we've talked about so the first is metta which is loving kindness, which is what we've been working on. The second one is karuna, which is compassion, which I've talked about as well, which is sort of slightly different and a whole realm in itself. The third one is called mudita, which is sympathetic joy. This one's another one that one can meditate on, is the joy of um, knowing that someone else is you know, happy and enjoying <coughs> life. So, you know, if you want to meditate on sympathetic joy, you know, if someone else is happy, you can sympathetically feel that happiness, you know. So I'm extremely happy at your efforts this, you know, this weekend and the difficulty that you've been putting yourself through, but you show up, nevertheless, it brings me great happiness to be able to teach this teaching to you. And you can sympathetically sort of go, you know, yay, Pete's happy. Isn't that great that he's happy? And it brings a lightness to your own heart, thinking that, you know, um, I'm, I'm happy for you. So that's a very way of creating a, a sort of a buoyancy in your heart. Um, and so it can be really, really useful in samadhi practice, because in samadhi practice, we're, we're trying to bring a sense of joy as well. Um, which eventually develops into something called piti, which is uh, uh, like a bubbling joy in your heart. And then the fourth one is upekka, which means equanimity. So the sort of deepest state of peace is a state of equanimity, where everything is perfect just the way it is. It's complete contentment in the present moment. And there's no compulsion to make anything different. You know, no compulsion to change the leg this way or change the leg that way or adjust the temperature up and down. I'm not saying that's a problem, but um, uh, you know, you have perfect equanimity uh, whether things are going good or bad. Of course, you would make judgments. Uh, you, you're still, you know, you can still make judgment. This is the time to end the meditation, I need to go up and have some food now or whatever, but 
there's you, you, you would you didn't you wouldn't there's no compulsion to have to do that. It's just purely oh yeah, it seems like logical time to go up and do that. So as I said, there's um, this is something that you'll be aware of, and there's a prayer um, often called the four measurables or a prayer for the four Brahma Viharas, which is what I learned when I started doing this practice. And so it's a little bit different to what I've taught you. Again, uh, I'll put it out there. If you, you know, wanted to research and you like it and you want to use it, then you, you can. Uh, but otherwise, I recommend staying with the one that I gave you or the ones perhaps that you're even using, creating yourself. So the mudita is, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So may all beings be happy and have the causes of more happiness. And then Karuna is, may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. So they may be free from anything that causes them suffering. May all, may all beings know the joy that is free from suffering. All beings have happiness. Yeah, the, the joy that is free from happiness. And that one's, that one's a real, that mudita, that sympathetic joy, I guess for me, is a little bit harder. But it's, 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 may they have that bubbling joyfulness, uh, which is di sort of slightly different to happiness. So may they experience the joy which is free from all suffering. Um, and it's a joy that comes from within. It's not necessarily a joy that they get through uh, going on holiday or winning the lotto, because that's seen as temporary, uh, whereas if you can bring that joy of just being alive, of just being happy that other people are happy, that's something that you can generate from within. And then the final one is the longest one. May all beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion, because that's effectively what equanimity is, is there's no attachment and aversion, to those near and far. <laughs> so it's everything, near and, and far. So, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings know the joy that is free from suffering. And may all beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. So, that's just another prayer as an alternative to the ones that you use. And I guess because I've been saying that prayer for a number of years now, many years in fact, um, it kind of has a certain resonance to it. Uh, I explained earlier that if you use these phrases over a long period of time, they, they, they become powerful, they become part of your neurology and they instantly, you know, bring up um, those, those feelings of meta that you want to bring up. So again, I'm just going to leave it at that. You can look up the four Brahma Viharas or the four measurables and um, you'll find lots and lots of information on the internet and there'll be books written about them, uh, etc. And it possibly will be something that you come across if you continue the meditation journey. Now, the practice that I mainly want to talk to you about this morning as well is, you know, quite a different practice from the Hawaiian Huna tradition. So completely the other side of the world to India and, and Tibet and places like this. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at any of these ancient traditions, like the Sufi tradition of Islam, the uh, Kabbalistic tradition of Judaism, you know, the, some of the mystic cr cr Christian traditions, some, some of the mystic teachings in Christianity even, you'll find strong similarities pointing to the same things, which I think is really beautiful uh, because, yeah, if there is one truth, eventually all traditions should point to that truth. Unfortunately, as we know, religions and traditions can get hijacked by people's agendas and people's yeah, leanings into what they think they mean and, and, and they can sort of move off. Um, and so it's beautiful when you see some of the older texts and the, uh, yeah, the more ancient parts of those religions. That they actually all seem to, to point to this beyondness. There's something beyond which is un, um, unavailable to the 
conceptual mind that almost needs to be felt into. And it points to uh, a, a sense of, yeah, of, uh, it's beyond description. In other words, it's beyond reality. It's beyond saying it's just this, it has many meanings. And it also always points to this sense of it's being imbued with love, imbued with compassion, imbued with um, a sense of meaning, and things like that. Um, and so too, the Huna tradition has a, a way of, a way of, it's another way of looking, uh, and it's very, very interesting. And uh, probably it's been brought most to prominence by a guy called Hugh Len, which we're going to have a look at in a moment. But just to introduce him, Hugh Len was um, taught by one of the great kahunas of Hawaii uh, in the practice of Hoponopono, uh, which is the tradition that they practice. And he became a, a great teacher, and he had a friend in the Hawaii State Hospital. Uh, who was in charge of the psych psychiatric ward. And, you know, they were having uh, a lot of patients coming into that ward and there was a lot of violence on the ward and perhaps possibly some of the um, staff, maybe weren't trained, but the staff were, were getting, um, you know, aggression towards them and things like that. And so they were in a bit of a pickle, a bit of desperate, and the, the head of this um, the Hawaii State Psychiatric Hospital, you know, reached out to Hugh and said, you know, is there anything that you could do to help us? He said, well, I know the Ho'oponopono process, maybe that can bring peace to people's minds, so I'll, I'll come in and help. And so he came in and he started working in the hospital and he started doing his own practice. And he really, he said, I didn't do anything. You'll see on the video, he said, all we did was like make cookies together and just, you know, I don't know, do, do just odd, odd things that just came to, to mind, whatever they wanted to do. But gradually, one by one, all of these um, patients started showing miraculous um, recoveries in their mental illnesses and he emptied out the whole psychiatric ward. So there was, at one point, there was no one left. No one left to teach. He had such a miraculous um, uh, effect on all the patients in, in this wing of the hospital. So, as you can imagine, that created a, a bit of a mythos around this guy. Um, and he's been interviewed by John Vitale and a lot of these sort of... Um, New Age um, wellness people. Um, there's a book out by John Vitale about him from various interviews. Um, and the interesting thing is that this is the real twist in the Hugh Len Ho'oponopono process is he believes if someone in my presence has a mental illness that's because I'm not pure enough. So I've got work to do. And if I'm pure, if I'm pure in my own uh, being, then it's impossible for there to be anyone in the world to have aggression or be you know, mentally unwell or possibly even physically unwell. So to the extent that anyone comes into my presence, that has any um, difficulty, illness, mental illness, you know, I've got work to do on myself. I've got work to do on myself. So a radical, totally radical way of looking at things. But he's sort of got the results there. So uh, it bears looking at. And so they asked him, you know, what is the process you do? He says, it's very, very simple. Um, so the Ho'oponopono process, you'll see, um, it's, a, it's a bit unclear because he, he talks about other faiths, he talks about God, he talks about forgiveness of the divine and of God. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of that sort of believing in 
in, in, a, in a divine. Um, again, everyone has a different version of what God is. You know, is it an old man sitting on a cloud somewhere? Or is it the essence of the universe, you know, the mother Gaia? Or is it something beyond or whatever? So irrespective of how everyone perceives what the divine is, you know, he, he, he sort of has this idea there's a divine that I need to ask for forgiveness about. So it's a simple process of just four steps. Um, two are, the first two are similar and the second two are similar. Uh, the first two steps is saying, I'm sorry. Why do you say sorry? Because if someone came into your field that is causing you trouble, or even that they're sick themselves, they don't even have to be causing you trouble, it's because you, it's your fault, basically. You did something in the past, you're not, you're not purified for that thing to um, come into your world, into your universe. So, uh, I'm sorry, I forgive you, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, if someone perpetrates something, this, probably more than anything, this is a forgiveness process. So if someone has done something to hurt you, it's the reason that they have hurt you is because, you know, I'm sorry, um, you know, it's my fault that you've come into my world. I forgive you. I forgive you. So it's part of the cleansing. And then thank you for this opportunity to do this cleansing because this is the one thing that you know I need to do she then would say and I love you I love you I love I love you um, to the person and doing this allows you to let go of any negativity you have around the person because you believe this is a manifestation for your benefit in order to help you. He calls it a cleansing, cleansing process. Is I've got cleaning to do. They, they appeared in my world because I've got more cleaning to do. So I need to clean myself, clean myself, clean myself, clean myself. And uh, so it uh, gets rid of all of that negativity. And then also, miraculously, often the negativity, you know, the person will apologize or something like that. Not that you're expecting that, uh, the, the, it's all the work is on you. Now, I want to explain um, about you can look at this process in many, many different ways. So, for example, you can look at it in terms of the other. So, I'm sorry. So, let's say Tracy's done something to hurt me. You know, I'm sorry. Um, that this, this whole thing has happened and I absolutely forgive you. This, this could be done to her face, but normally it's sort of done in your own mind. So I forgive you. Thank you for this opportunity to, to, to do cleaning and I love you. I know that you're a great person and you have qualities and you're also going through your suffering and I love you. And that does the cleaning. Now, you could also look at it as the self. So I'm sorry to myself. I'm sorry to myself that this situation arise, you know? And I forgive myself for having this manifestation in the world. Having this manifestation in the world. Thank you to myself for uh, recognizing that and giving me the opportunity to do some cleansing. And I love you. I love. I love the, the part of me that is doing this. So you could actually take this same prayer and the object could be the self. And finally, the object could be the divine. So I'm sorry to the divine. I'm sorry that this whole thing happened. Uh, I forgive you. you know, I forgive the universe for imposing this on me. Thank you actually to the universe because all the God or how the divine, however you want to perceive it. And I love you. I love this divine aspect and this opportunity to, to give, um, uh, to give, uh, to, to, do, to do this cleaning process. So there's a lot of ways that you can see to sort of um, work with this whole process um, and different levels of reification. So is this person real that is perpetrating against you? 
and in which case I forgive you. Right? Maybe this person is not real and that what's really happening is my projection because they probably don't think that they've done anything wrong. It's only me who thinks that they've done something wrong. So you can look at, uh, it's just the mind. So you can look at it on that level. Or is there no such thing as the other person and me? It's just a divine dance of uh, manifestation <coughs> that is playing out on the cosmic scale <coughs> through me and through you, just as part of the evolution and the whole enlightenment of the whole universe. Is it God, you know, is it the divine that is just doing this as part of the divine unfolding of the universe? So it can challenge you on many different ways of looking. Um, and again, this is not to say that any of those are necessarily real or unreal. I'm not going to sort of fight to, to make a stance on either way. The whole point is what allows you to forgive what allows you to let go? What allows you to find more spaciousness? What allows you to develop more meta? Yeah? So, yeah. Oh, and I've gone on to say about ways of looking, which I've sort of said. You know, there are three ways of looking. The ordinary way of looking, which we, we perceive, yep, yep, there's a person, here's me, they've hurt me. That's the ordinary way. This idea that actually everything out there is a perception of my own mind. And then there's not even a me, everything is this divine nature. So, yeah. So, with that, um, what I might do is uh, let you get experience the man himself because there was a series of interviews. Um, it's, a, it's split up into nine sections. I'll just play you a couple, uh, but you'll have the links and on the video, I'll put the links well, I'll link the first video and from there you can navigate to all the other uh, videos. But we'll have a look here. I've set up this beautiful impromptu studio for us to have a, a film at. So uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that and then we'll, I'll answer any questions that you might have.